Okay. Well, on behalf of IMEA, the State Department of Education, and District 3, I would like to welcome you to today's virtual PD opportunity. Tonight, we are fortunate to have IMEA immediate past president, Kathy Stefani, presenting social emotional learning in the music classroom. Kathy teaches at McDonald Elementary in Moscow, Idaho. Today's presentation will be recorded and can be viewed later on the IMEA YouTube channel, where you will be able to access all of these virtual PD opportunities. Immediately following the presentation, Kathy will answer any questions you might have, so please feel free to put your questions or comments in the chat and I will be monitoring them. I would like to thank Megan Olswanger and the leadership from District 3, IMEA, and the State Department of Ed for providing these opportunities. Please remember that we are trying to continue these presentations throughout the fall and are still looking for volunteers to present on their expertise. I will put my email in the chat and please reach out if you have something to share. Tune in next week on Tuesday, September 22nd for Robert Perez Lawrence presenting Logic Pro X for music teaching materials and live instruction. At this time, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in and hopefully you'll watch this also later on the YouTube channel. And at this time, I would like to turn the time over to Kathy Stefani. And Kathy, thank you so much for being willing to present for us tonight. My pleasure. Thank you so much, for Rebecca, not only for this one, but for the uh, chance to put all of these together. I want to uh, share my screen with folks uh, right away. And uh, some of this takes a little bit of time to, to load, and so I don't want to take your time. I want to be respectful of you being here uh, with us this evening. I've, um, it's been my pleasure to uh, serve for IMEA for the last four years. Uh, they have a, a six-year program where you're president-elect for two years, then uh, president, and I've just started my immediate past president uh, duties, and they, they uh, have gone light at the end because they know that you've worked hard and uh, they, they want you to hang in there for a little bit longer. So I'm, I'm thrilled to do that. And uh, one of the things that I had the pleasure of doing this summer, and I, I say the pleasure because it really turned out well, lots of webinars. This was an unusual summer. Uh, I've never traveled so little. I'm usually on the road more. Uh, that changed. And so the opportunity came up for an awful lot of professional development and um, social emotional learning was one of the buzzwords that, that came out this summer and all the different uh, things that I would attend. And I, I knew what that meant, but I heard other people talk about it, wanted to make sure we had a, a common definition. And here we are now six months into um, the pandemic and the change that has come upon schools and upon teachers. And so I wanted to share with you some of the things that, um, that I was able to glean from the research that I did. And I, I really enjoyed it. I told a couple friends that I geeked out a little bit on social emotional learning. And I've learned a lot and set some goals for myself that I'll share with you um, in, in just a minute. So let's get started. Um, this summer, many of the webinars that were presented by NAFME and other music associations included social emotional verbiage in their discussions of how to teach online. And though I've heard this for a long time, I decided that I wanted to have a definition uh, so I, I knew just what direction this was going. So I, um, I ordered two books, Music Education and Social Emotional Learning by Scott Edgers, uh, who spoke at several of the NAFME webinars, and Responsive cl uh, Classroom for Music, Art, PE, and Other Specialists, uh, published, or, excuse me, published by Responsive Classroom. It's a compilation book. We'll discuss the first uh, which is split in two portions, first section academic, and the second is uh, practical hands-on classroom ideas. Uh, you're looking at the index of the responsive classroom book. Uh, those are the various chapters. Um, if some of those uh, are of interest to you, both books were just um, tremendous resources. I was very pleased that I, I picked them both up. Um, then we'll discuss uh, the second book with uh, some practical ideas. I also interviewed a family therapist and received some insights that we'll use to summarize as we uh, work through this this evening. Most social emotional learning in schools looks like programming uh, brought in for assemblies to designate a portion of time to a particular subject, which covers a number of topics. 
and we're probably very familiar with the DARE program. Uh, secondary schools have some of this a little bit more so or in a more obvious way that catches the eye. Suicide prevention, uh, student success in the top left corner of your screen. Uh, that's one of the programs for the younger students where the uh, counselor comes into the classroom and works with the students maybe once a week on a, uh, a topic about responsibility or honesty. So those are um, programs that are curriculum that's, that's ready to go. Uh, in 2006, Cassell uh, coined the phrase the collaborative for academic, social, and emotional learning, which we'll refer to tonight as SEL. Dr. Tim, Tim Lutzenhauser, who is uh, well known to many music educators, he's been in the uh, profession for years, he wrote the forward and praise it, praising the effort to articulate and quantify the effects of music in SEL and defines it with cultivates both the cognitive and effective growth of those involved. And, and this book kind of puts um, rubber to the road in that we all know that music and the arts uh, touch our students in such important ways that are really hard to articulate sometimes. And administrators appreciate that too, um, but it is nice to have the ability to articulate it so that um, there's some teeth to what we all know to be the case uh, for our students in the classroom. Our discussion focuses on 80% of the population of our students who require or deserve universal prevention. This is not intended to cover the 20% of students who need more targeted attention, and we would be remiss if we were to step into that realm. So um, those students, 5% that have intense needs, intention individual attention, some of them uh, maybe one-on-one -on -one with the student, those should be referred. 15% of the students targeted prevention, um, some ind indication of risk, maybe issues at home, targeted attention, again, those are referrals. So 80% are what we are better equipped for. <clears throat> Edgar's uh, uh, cites five components for us to be aware of as educators educators and these are areas where we can have an impact so from left to right self-awareness is the first who am i am i a musician am i an athlete we see a lot of the secondary kids grappling with this even though the elementary kids um, are dealing with it as, as well just in a less defined sort of way um, can i be both can i be in both worlds as a musician as an athlete all those different um, areas that we see kids struggling with Social awareness, can I navigate the relationship with those I identify with and those I don't? Can I be, can I meld into a number of groups? Can I work through things with people that I might not strongly identify with? In the middle, responsible decision making, and this includes identifying problems and problem solving. Self-management would include impulse control, self-motivation, goal setting, organizational skills, and that has become paramount in this time of online learning. Those students who are organized, who are self-motivated, this is a lesser issue for them. And if students are um, not the organized kind of student and things are all over the place with papers, with schedules, this is a very tough time. Finally, relationship skills, communication, and building and maintaining relationships, both negotiating refusal, and conflict management. So many different components that are key to what we teach, but you don't sign up for a class. The bell doesn't ring and you don't walk into an SEL classroom. I wanted to share with you two statements that caught my attention as I was reading and wondered what your impressions were. Perhaps it's from experience or working in varied age assignments, but I think that music teachers are very much aware of the social emotional relationship we have with students because of our own music education background. So he states that often music teachers feel unprepared to effectively teach SEL or to engage students on a social emotional level. And secondly, instructing students beyond the music can seem daunting, especially given the magnitude of what is already expected of music educators. I don't disagree with those, but there are aspects that I, I guess I feel a little bit differently about. We're in this because someone made an impact on us. That doesn't mean that we're prepared for all of the ins and outs, like the first quote reads, but we are keenly aware of the difference between ourselves and our academic core colleagues. Um, having gone through high school and in various, um, whether it's charter school, home school, um, the public school setting, in each of those, um, it's not usually the math teacher 
that the students come and share their heart with. It's not the, the uh, social studies teacher where they go in and sit down and have lunch and spend that extra time. And we've done that as students. And I, I guess it's my opinion. I'm curious what you think um, as we finish up tonight. Um, I think that, that arts people are aware of that and we need to be prepared, but we do know that that social emotional aspect, I think, is coming to us. We know that the kids are looking at us in a little bit different vein. And even the subject that we deal with uh, brings up emotions, brings up um, a different part of affect for our students that we're aware of that we deal with. And I, um, I just was curious about that particular statement when I read it. SEL can also be a controversial subject. The items on the left would seem to be a reasonable list of character traits that we want to instill in children. But the definition or implementation of those is not agreed upon by all. I've highlighted some that caught my own eye and some that I've dealt with with students. And on the right side, <clears throat> there are educational concerns, including who are we to decide what character traits or social mores our children should have? That should be taught at home. I taught with two educators years ago when I was a, a new teacher who, um, uh, uh, a lady and a gentleman that both taught um, fourth grade, co-taught together, and their attitude was, um, the parents aren't doing a good job, I need to step in and I'm going to educate these kids in all aspects as to what they should think. And, and not that they stepped into the world of politics, but dabbled in it a little bit. And I remember thinking that they had good intentions, they meant well, but were they overstepping that line? Um, sex education has been a hot topic for years, but this past summer has put more topic, uh, topics on that same list. Um, I have a five page small print document sitting on my desk listing numerous songs now that I need to rethink as part of my teaching. So um, we come across this uh, in numerous ways throughout our days, secondary and elementary. Edgar's list 10 functions of music in our students' lives. And you can look those over, but on the right-hand side, number seven through 10 are defined as impacted strongly by music education, such as the use of music in state occasions, expressing cultural values, using music to, to bring people together. Ritual, tradition, or consistency are part of SEL, and music is integrally part of those. We think of music for athletics, holidays, uh, political campaigns, fairs, and festivals. My two daughters had a conversation once about my grandchildren attending home or public school. One wanted to homeschool, having say over all the curriculum and the content and the delivery. And the other one, a sociology major, challenged her that public school provided a basis for commonality, shared experiences, and cultural connections. After, um, it, didn't get heated. They had a lengthy conversation and finally agreed to disagree, especially since mom's a public school teacher. But um, they were discussing the role of public education and how it does affect our students and, and the impact that we as arts teachers have in that domain especially. Edgar states that we music educators are tremendously influential to the development of our students' identities because we teach them during their primary socialization years, the one listed on top. Uh, both we elementary and secondary teachers. We see our students for consecutive years, and if you're K-12, you're it. This provides continuity for students, which could be argued for the good or the bad. Most administrators will say that they would still rather have a weak teacher in a position than having a revolving door because that relationship between the teacher and the student has a large impact on the learning. So if that teacher can make an, an impact with those students in a relational way, um, that student's going to want to come to school, be involved in class. We all know that there are weaknesses in our own content. Um, we have our strengths and, and weaknesses in our own areas, but we also know how to find resources to help our students. So that relationship to connect with students is huge, and administrators recognize that. For elementary music, um, let me share these with you. General music often provides a sense of consistency over a child's elementary career. Um, I've got my students from kindergarten all the way through fifth grade. Um, they kind of get to be the seniors by the time they've been through there several times. Uh, and I'm that constant face when they walk in that hallway the first day of school and they're nervous with the new backpacks. Uh, myself and the librarian, the PE teacher, we're those consistent faces that they see. And there's just that degree of, okay, 
I know this, this is a comfortable place for me. I can deal with the new because there's still something solid that I know. Uh, my favorite moments as an elementary general music teacher were often the times when students came to my classroom during lunch, often saying that they wanted to help me with some me menial tasks, but usually because they wanted to tell me about a song that they liked, sing a song with their friends, play on the ORP instruments, or just talk. That is so true and, and uh, goes back to what I said before about that doesn't usually happen in the history class. And lastly, uh, from Edgar's, the benefits of these connections should not be trivialized. And I just so appreciate that he states that for us. Um, these are not, the, uh, these aren't extras. It's not optional. It's not for the top talent. Uh, Well-rounded means just exactly that. I live near a large engineering complex that has bought more property in our area and they're expanding all the time. They put money into our local economy, into our university, even into our airport. But they host a talent show every year, kind of an American Idol sort of format. And it goes on for weeks with large prizes, um, a great big trip at the end. And they know that creativity and community are achieved through musical means. And they use that to build community in their um, organization. You've probably heard that same kind of thing about Google and some of the Silicon Valley that um, they know that the uh, SEL portions that we deal with are important to their employees. Secondary, um, I'm supposing that these ideas could describe nearly all of us. The music or music education somewhere had a deep impact on us and caught our attention. If it weren't for the band program, I don't know where my daughter would be in school in high school. So many parents say that. Um, kids just don't connect someplace else, but they connect with the kids or they connect with the director. Um, it's their home away from home. A lot of statements made along that that Eggers was able to say that that particular phrase was heard over and over again in his research. And lastly, teacher candidates. Uh, they made the statement that the music room became their home during high school. And I think that um, many of us could uh, agree with that as well. So um, there are uh, several themes that he identifies through his research, and I want to share, share some of these with you before we land on these top two. Um, emotional responses to music are consistent and predictable. Secondly, music evokes emotions, not perceived emotions. Again, he goes back to that it's not trivialized, that these are um, very much uh, tangible emotions. Third, music evokes emotions at many different emotional levels. Uh, again, emotional reactions involve interactions between the music, the listener or the performer, and the setting where all of this happens. Um, number five, music evokes mainly positive emotions, but anxiety and arousal are specifically noted. So we're gonna talk about those in a second. And finally, the listener performer provides meaning to the music and thus determines the emotion. So let's take a minute and consider some of these common uh, scenarios. Again, he cites that anxiety and arousal are some of the, um, and don't get ahead of me here, but arousal, he, he uh, defines that in a little bit different term. But these two, especially by music, we need to be aware of. So I chose Jeopardy, tried to find a sound link for us to play it, but I bet if I pause, you're all humming it in your head. And it's fun to sing with my students when we're completing a time task. Do, 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 do. And we sing along. And if you recall, it modulates in the middle. And the, the tension builds just a little bit more. So it's fun to sing with my students when we're finishing up a task. But there's anxiety if Alex Trebek is waiting for your answer. Uh, families and friends can be poised, even stoic, at a funeral. But when the music starts, emotions show. And we as musicians probably have experienced that, whether you've been a singer or an instrumentalist and played at a, a funeral. Once that music starts, uh, there's just something above and beyond that helps bring that emotion to, uh, to the surface. Not that that's necessarily what you want to have happen. It just does. It's, um, and in that sense, there's a different kind of anxiety. Um, a hard memory can become softened with time. A song that Maybe you played at a funeral that belonged to the uh, person that passed. It's just so hard to hear for a long time and it just cuts to the core. But after time, it becomes a sweet memory and you, you hear that song and you almost want to hear it because it brings back special memories. So um, music can be twofold and that's why, again, the setting, the person, 
the timing all affects this so much. Um, arousal uh, can be romantic music, but it's a, a heightened sense of awareness. And so when you, you think of the organ hitting do, 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 uh, a wedding music might uh, have a lot of different emotions. It can be thrilling for the bride, bittersweet for the parents, uh, maybe hit a nerve with the groom. When that music starts, it, this is real. And there's that emotion that, that happens with it. And uh, you're seeing some of my, uh, my bias here. Um, I'm up from the North, uh, I'm a U of I girl. And we are in the market of hitting that arousal nerve with much of the music that we use with our students. And so I especially appreciate this picture with the trumpets up in the air at the football game, they're playing up high and, and building that energy. And that's what we wanna do. And when we think of Friday nights, uh, basketball, gyms, graduations, all those things where we as performers are intending to be part of an emotional response um, in, in a good way. Um, but we need to be aware of what that does to our students uh, on, on a daily basis as they, as they rehearse it. So let me share a couple uh, specific examples with you. I taught years ago in a small school, Council Idaho, and I had um, a number of years where I had some outstanding individual performers that all came together in class at the same time. And um, I chose Dan Buckvich's Electricity. If you're familiar with Dan, he's one of our um, gems here in, in Idaho, pardon the pun, uh, a percussionist that does a lot of composing for us. And um, this particular piece of music uses a lot of percussion. It's a driving beat. The, um, the members of the band have flashlights under their chairs. And so there's all this sound that's going with turbines moving. Uh, it's supposed to be a lot of power and energy. And then the electricity goes out. And so it kind of winds down, it's silent, it's dark in the gym, and then the kids start turning on flashlights as the music starts up again. And um, I was, I will be honest with you, probably didn't pace well as a young teacher, and I landed on this too long. Um, let me play a segment for you and think of yourself as a high school student rehearsing this, um, uh, a great level five piece that we worked on every day. I'll play just a segment for you. is an awful lot of counting that goes on um, and so it, uh, the students are very involved and um, I had one of my saxophones player and his mom uh, came and visited with me had a very pleasant conversation but she said can you just play Louie Louie or maybe play the fight song and I said well we study all periods of music and I want to expose the kids to all different kinds of things but there is a curriculum that I am supposed to go through as well and she said oh I didn't realize that she said well we got to be honest with you rehearsing that song day after day when he would leave the music classroom didn't have a headache but just his angst was high maybe blood pressure just felt physically exhausted from counting from having that percussion going all the time and i was so glad that they said something i was able to pace my rehearsals differently uh, maybe even let him out of the room sometimes i would rehearse that piece last and let him go around errands um, and he was very appreciative of that and stayed with me for years I didn't want to lose him. The um, the level of, of the music itself, the, what I was doing, and so that's something I share with you to consider as you choose repertoire. On the right hand side, and I practiced this a little bit. Um, I want to make sure that you can still hear me. Oh, my apologies. Let me go back. Brian's song. I'm, I'm dating myself just a little bit. I was in sixth grade, 11 years old, when Brian's song was a popular movie, and at that time, uh, my grandfather died. Uh, I was very close with him, visited every weekend, uh, went and stayed with my grandpa and grandma in the summertime. And he was the first person I ever knew that, that died. Um, I missed about a week of school uh, during that time for the, the funeral, the family all came together. And I remember some of the impacts at that time that 
uh, my grandmother came home in the afternoon about three o'clock or so and and I knew what that meant that grandpa had passed and um, at five o'clock that evening the news came on I don't think that we were listening to it but it was on in the background and I was shocked that the news came on because I thought my grandfather just died don't they know how how can the world keep going and I struggled with that thought a lot the next day sun came up of course and people went to school and people went to work and I thought but my grandfather died and so I struggled through that for for some time when I came back to school uh, we were a typical general music classroom um, did folk songs and played instruments the teacher had found the theme to Brian's song uh, and I, I can't find the um, uh, audio for you which is maybe just as well um, and she really enjoyed this piece and thought the students would enjoy it. It was a popular song and we were going to end the year with it. I came to class and didn't realize that they had started singing it while I was gone. And as the music started, it just cut me to the core. And I put my head down and I wasn't sure how to leave the room. I didn't want to get in trouble. One of my girlfriends was sitting beside me and she caught the teacher's eye and, and helped, excuse me, I went out in the, in the hallway and I just fell apart and I, I didn't step away from the door. I wasn't quite sure where to go and I listened to the song and it was just the end of me. I stayed out there and that was fine and the teacher came out and gave me a hug and I think all was well and we went back to class. But when we came back again, the song was there and it was there from the 1st of April all the way through the end of the school year. And after uh, the third or fourth rehearsal, I asked, um, uh, I, I told my classroom teacher what was going on, that I, I didn't mean to be making a scene. I didn't want to. Um, could I maybe wait till the kids were done singing it and then go in or do it at the end? And she understood. So she talked to the music teacher who was sure that I would love this song. And she meant well, but she never, she wouldn't excuse me from class. She didn't put the song away. And again, paced it kind of like I did. We sang it a lot. And it was just the end of me. And um kind of beat me over the head with it unknowingly for uh, for the rest of that time. As I left elementary music, I just wanted no part of it. I didn't care for music. I couldn't get away from it fast enough. In eighth grade, my schedule was such that I couldn't get out of anything else and they stuck me in a choir. And I connected with that teacher and she changed everything, connected with me, I connected with music. And, um, and so I share that with you because of the impact I went through as a student think of who is in your classroom that you can share those same kind of things um, what are you playing what kind of effect is it having on your kids are you able to look up and get away from the music and look and see are they loving it is it too much do you need to move on what things can you do to, to help serve your students in that respect and this particular one there was a time i knew what my students emotions would be with this picture and now i question whether or not to include it um, Anxiety, ar arousal, always started the fourth grade year with it immediately as it's written on September 14th. So I would start it right away, often had a bulletin board with it up. Uh, this year, school is all messed up at the beginning. We've had a, uh, some delay issues. So I know the issue's still coming, but I have to grapple, grapple with this. So here are some people that I'm hoping you can relate to. Eggers um, shares with us a story about Sean the singer who was in two choirs, Madrigals, show choir, the school musical. Um, the non-music faculty and students identified him as the singer. Um, the whole school knew it. Choir director in the room were safe environments like we've spoken about before. And when school was over, he became a music ed major, noting that his high school experience was key. And that's probably the situation for a lot of us or other people that we know. What happened in those four years was huge. And we went on uh, to become music ed people or mu musicians. Cullen is a, another student uh, in, in the band uh, instrumental area, but different experience. Played set, played drum set from the third grade, started elementary band on trumpet. Doesn't say why, doesn't say if he had to or if he chose to, but started on another instrument. Never learned the bell kit, was not a percussionist in, in the full sense. Close group of friends who were not band members. He got an athletic waiver and um, he was from a bigger school. Some of you are familiar with this. He was in the curricular band, but not in the marching band because he was an athlete. He feels left out of band. Uh, not really when asked uh, if, he, if he has friends in band. His answer is not, not really. Uh, the director is focused on competition, 
Cullen feels uh, that that hinders their relationship, takes private lessons on drum sets. So that's great. The student is fully uh, vested. He practices weekly in his second uh, rock band. And it doesn't say on this, but he's very frustrated with the members of the rock band because they're not committed. They're not there and into it like he is. So he's a very serious musician. Um, soon as the year is over, I'm out. That's the statement that he made to the author. But uh, later on, as they were editing it, he was featured in a jazz band uh, solo and ended the year by saying that he might stay. Two very different experiences. I've had both students, um, and I'm wondering if you have as well. I've had both, but I, I did not give Cullen the same time and attention as Sean. Um, frankly, it was more work. Um, I'm sad to say it didn't feed my ego. It wasn't a sure thing, but it was my job to have been equitable. Are you being equitable with your students that you have? The entire second half of Edgar's book is practical. And, and if you don't have it, it's a great resource book. It's got uh, papers in the back that you could just um, copy and ready to go to give to students immediately. There's worksheets, there's surveys, many great things for teaching online. I've included five of us tonight for you to get an idea. The English classroom is seen as a primary source for SEL students and often uh, expresses opinions and assignments and discussions. But music equally so, if not more. He has a lyric analysis assignment that we'll talk about here where students discuss both text and artistic approach when discussing how to include emotion in the performance. These examples are dated and for a reason, so that the instructor can use them for a teaching purpose rather than the students focusing on the popularity of the artist. Then students are allowed to bring in their own, but their analysis must include how the artist created emotion in music. Did they use tempo, instrumentation, dynamics, textures, etc.? So I, um, I was fortunate enough for a long time to teach history of rock and roll. Great class to connect with students and a, a excellent history credit, social studies credit. I chose Eleanor Rigby. Uh, if you don't, if you're not aware of the song, it's uh, about homeless people. And Eleanor Rigby is um, the stage name uh, John Lennon calls it. She was a real uh, person that lived outside his apartment in Manhattan. And he ha she had a shopping cart and uh, he wrote this song. And I'll share this with you so you can listen for it as we listen to example. I believe it's the cellos. Um, uh, this is recorded with the Beatles and with the, an orchestra. He keeps a constant beat going and uh, Paul McCartney describes it as wanting folks to feel time is of the essence, that time is rushing by, there's a constant pulse that's ticking away, and time is getting away and we're not taking care of people. So listen for that aspect. great song, but uh, the focus is supposed to be not just the song, but what's the aspect of musicianship? Is it dynamics? Is it tempo? Is it texture? And, or all of the above. So the students um, can't just bring in any song. They've got to have some analysis or they do that as a class with it. Great exercise and, and great exercise for online. Oh, it's giving me fits. Here we go. Uh, the second one, um, Teacher gives each student this survey to fill out to include their musical identity within their overall identity. I just, I really like this one. Um, the teacher gives this small card to the students. They fill it out. And in this case, the one that I'm most familiar with, the teacher took it and typed up their answers and then included their actual school picture in the self-portrait. She laminated it and gave it back to the kids, kind of like a, a driver's license. And they put it on the front um, when you open up your band folder or choir folder, they put it on the, the flap on the inside. And I thought, what a great way to get your kids thinking about um, their musical identity. Uh, collegiate music education deals with this and helping new teachers find their identity as teachers, moving on from student, a huge step to make when you've been a student your entire life. Um, that was for free. I'm the IMEA mentorship chair. So I'm, I'm working with new educators, but finding that identity is very critical and not always easy to do. 
Uh, this is a sample, sample practice journal that he has. Again, one of the pieces that um, you can copy and go. Uh, pardon my uh, cut and pasting down at the bottom there. But the students put their name and the, the piece that they're working on. If you look part way through, based on your practice, uh, what will be your objectives? So the students talk about the musicality of it. Then what emotions did you feel while you were practicing? Um, encourage a robust emotional vocabulary. Were you pleased or frustrated with your practice session? Um, so there are those things that are woven right into the music day. This is not designed to give you more work to do and more standards to cover, but to make it part of what the kids are doing naturally um, alongside their curricular work. An emoji practice. This would be for younger kids. You write the name of the, the piece or the composer on the left-hand side, discuss what musical element, and then the students get to uh, circle an emoji. They can come up with their own. Um, I love the one rubbing the chin. I, I have to think about this one. Or does it make them sad? Does it make them mad? Um, it helps us to be aware of that anxiety or arousal or other emotions that our students are feeling. Uh, either while they're playing or listening to samples. And this last one, it's one of my favorites that I think we all get. This assignment is a class role play for rejection as a soloist for a show or failing an audition for an ensemble. Do we take the time to walk our kids through that possible scenario? How do they react to us if we're the ones that reject their performance? What words are appropriate to express their feelings? And when is the appropriate time? Um, sometimes I feel like we set our kids up for failure by not letting them express those words of anger or words of sadness. So um, to role play that with your students, you or, uh, and another student to act that out or two students to act it out and one with anger, one with sadness. Um, how do I tell my parents and the embarrassment? Uh, we need to let our students prepare for that um, as they prepare for the audition. I really like that one. I hadn't thought of that before. This, is, uh, this slide is just to clarify that we are not intended to be a part of every problem and it's not our place to fix it. There's a time to ask for professional help and school counselors and administrators are trained in your building. So the things on the left are things that, um, that we are not trained for, other people are. But on the right hand side, encouraging and decision making, those are things that um, we can assist our students to. So we need to know the difference. Once, you, uh, once advice is given, the teacher becomes responsible for potential outcomes. And I hope you let that weigh on your shoulders because um, it's, uh, it's tempting to uh, give that advice. I wish I could say that I always hated Edgar's advice, but in the moment when a student is confiding, you need to have had that talk with yourself about how do I end this discussion or delay it until it's with the right person? How can I be empathetic but ethical? Students are not adults and their emotions are often in control. Ours cannot be. Always position yourself that you're not alone with a student in a room with a closed door. Walk with me. Let's, uh, let's take a walk while I go to the copier. All of those things get you headed to the office. And either way, tell administration as soon as possible, even if you think it amounts to nothing. Um, we'll move on here into the elementary category. Just a few things here. Um, teacher language. Are you careful when you say, I noticed that you, because it allows interaction with your students. You were able to, you wanna name what your students were successful at so that they can identify it. In reminding us, asking for interaction, who remembers thus and such? Who remembers how we do a procedure? Who remembers content? Careful on open-ended questions. Don't start a question, and we've all had educators who do this. They're fishing for the right answer. and two or three people say what they think it is and all of a sudden nobody answers anymore because you can tell the teacher's looking for something in particular. So be sure an open-ended question really is that, allow for something open-ended. Interactive modeling is part of the uh, classroom re or responsive classroom that I think is just great for those of us who are novices or those of us who've taught for a long time. We need to say, let's say it's a classroom procedure, how you're gonna walk in and out the room so that there's not mayhem. Um, say what you're going to do and model it, act it out, and then ask the students what they noticed. Number four, have other students get up. Students um, research shows that they learn when and they interact, when uh, not with us just talking. So invite one or more students to come up and model it. Again, ask the students what did they notice and then let them practice. Too often we're in a hurry and now uh, we've lost 
time with our students. Uh, ever since March, we've been home and there's that pressure to pick up where we left off or, or to get that content back in where, because uh, we can't pick up where we left off. But that's a goal that um, is, is pretty lofty for right now. We have to model for our students, walk them through it so they can be successful, not, not be rushed. Um, this one's good for any age. I, I like this. Make sure that you put your rules up. Use, um, use your space for vi visual learners and it'll save your time. You can just point to something up on the wall. Students learn best through interaction, so make sure you minimize your talking. And um, to, to finish with tonight, this is just, uh, this turned out to be a, a special, especially great bonus. I was able to interview Peg Davies, a licensed marriage family therapist in Washington State. And she shared with me some things that she's seeing, particularly in these um, COVID times. And she said that um, prior to COVID, anxiety in students uh, from K to 12 was on the, um, on the incline, but COVID even more so. And she explained to me that anxiety particularly is about the future. When students or adults are fretting about what's to come, they have no control over it, worrying about um, down the road. And it's a cause for mental distraction. So we as educators need to be aware of that. When that's running through their mind, they're not um, delighted by what we're doing at the board. They've got other things that are um, fighting, uh, we're competing with that anxiety that they have. For depression, just the opposite, worrying about um, and fixating on things in the past, um, not being able to get beyond that, take that next step. Um, again, it creates a lack of control and another cause for mental distraction. So we as educators can't just say, take a breath, get over it, move on. We've got to deal with where they are so that we can bring them into our content. Um, and she shared with me the benefits of music, which I you would think that we would all know this, but as it applies to SEL, participating in music requires a presentness, a awareness and a, a mindfulness. And she talked about beat, that if you're, whether you're playing uh, a song, listening to a song, or uh, for most of us, we're participants, even as an audience, it requires an attention to beat. Our students have to pay attention to beat, even if they're not good at it, they're supposed to be aiming for what we want them to do with the beat, with pitch. They're supposed to be matching pitch and listening. And all those things bring them in to the here and now. Um, we're not writing math, uh, I, I don't mean to pick on math, but we're not writing equations up on the board that you could daydream and turn and, and look out uh, the window. The, the music starts, the director's up front, the people around you are all engaged, and you don't really have a choice but to interact with that. Even if you are distracted, there are things that are calling you into the music classroom. So she finds music to be a huge help um, in helping these students who are so distracted by either anxiety or depression. And it's difficult to participate inattentively. Even if you try to daydream, the, uh, um, like the piece that I played for you before, the electricity or other songs, um, there's rhythm, there's sound that just can't be ignored. And it's to the benefit of our students. It brings them into the here and now. Um, some of the key takeaways that, that she shared with me, we learn best when we're safe. And that's something that's just not the case right now for some of our kids or for ourselves. Does the teacher have a plan? She shared with me, when a student walks in a classroom, can they see that this teacher has a plan for me? Can I see it? And can I trust it? Um, is, your, is your room a place that's um, organized? And I like to say that my room has organized chaos. And chaos, uh, organized chaos is acceptable, she said. Chaos is not. If students see that there's a purpose, there's a meaning, and that I have a plan for it, or we have a plan for it, then it can be trusted. So think about your room. When students come in, do you look like you've attended to it? Do you look like you have a goal and a direction that you're taking them? And that's especially hard for some of the adults she's saying right now. We have to pull ourselves together, maybe fake it till we make it, because our students need to see that um, trustworthiness in us. And lastly, rituals serve a purpose. Um, maybe homecoming Friday, we're online. Is there going to be something that marks that day that would have been homecoming? Um, can you take student videos and send them out to classroom, uh, film your band, film your choir singing the school song and send it out to all the staff and at two o'clock on uh, homecoming Friday afternoon, uh, everybody listens to it together. Something that brings you together uh, for that commonality, something that you share. 
Which brings me to a few advocacy points. That, um, oh, she shared these two uh, resources with me that Rebecca can maybe share with us uh, as we finish up this evening and make these available. Mindfulness in the Classroom is a project that Goldie Hawn um, works on. She's a, a celebrity. Mindup.org mind is her site, and she goes into the classroom and works with students on mindfulness. The got, um, Miss Davies is a Gottman therapist, and so emotional coaching educators is one of the projects that they have uh, under Gottman.com. So those are some additional resources you can look at. Um, in Moscow this last year, one of our projects that we did as a music staff was um, we elementary teachers put up going on a bear hunt for our elementary students, but we are the Moscow Bears, and we challenged the community by writing a letter to the editor to asking folks to put bears in their windows as students were going outside on walks and the students could count them. We didn't make it a competition. We didn't want them to turn it in as an assignment, but as they walked with their parents around the community to, um, to have kind of a welcome feeling that the community was aware of them. We had a realtor in town put up a, a doll case with a, a bear in every single one of them. One of my students saw a real bear uh, in the community. Um, one of my students saw 300 bears. And at the end, we took some of the bears that were around town. It was a three month project. Um, and then we wrote another letter to the editor thanking people for all the participation that they put in. And one of the things I noted was many of the bears had their arms held out. And it was a welcoming feeling at a time when the pandemic was new and, and it's even difficult right now, but new for our young students. Let me share just a moment of this with you. If you act like that and then bee. We ended, um, our high school is the, the Bears, and as the seniors graduated, they put their signs up in the uh, yards in their windows as well, and the students went around because a lot of my younger kids don't know what a senior means, and so it was an opportunity for uh, the entire community to, to come together. Um, we got two newspaper articles out of that. We had signs all over town. It was great advocacy, and so... Um, I would encourage you to find a project that can make music visible this year. It's, um, it's easy as we have lower number of students for uh, our subject to maybe disappear just a, a little bit and we don't want that to happen. Let me, um, this is in my um, hallway right now. I volunteered to take over a great big bulletin board that people don't really wanna do. A good friend of mine showed me how to cricket this year. And so um, she made masks for me and we put up different singers and used the masked singer approach and idea to uh, put in the hallway. I'm gonna leave this up. I must tell you, my faculty has stopped by my door nearly every single day. Uh, the students aren't with us yet. We haven't started school due to the smoke. But the faculty has said, I love so-and-so and who's on the end? And they've been told not to look at the answer key uh, unless they absolutely have to but they're challenging themselves and they've given me lots of ideas. So I'm putting out a suggestion box. Um, uh, it, it's hitting a nerve and I'm very pleased. Uh, one of my colleagues started a ukulele club for the staff last year. And um, that's something that you could consider right now. We've got some staff that are wishing the year was over and it's only September. We've had tears and anger and some people quitting. One colleague started a, a faculty uh, ukulele club and I gave them several options. They could attend in the morning or the afternoon. Um, so that's, uh, it's more to do. If you've got room on your plate, it would be great. I love this picture for circle drumming. I chose this gentleman because he's just 
loving it. And that's what we wanted to do. I know the Boise area and some others have marimba uh, ensembles. And just the joy of getting together. My mom's neighbor has a, a Tuesday night marimba group all summer. And they're just having fun, but it's purposeful, it's scheduled, it's creative. Uh, your mind has to be focused on the action of others. You're working in a group. I don't know if you have time for that. I'm trying to consider if I do. So let me share with you uh, just some, some things you can think about, and maybe Rebecca can share this with us later. I don't want to go through this for you. But are there the, some small things, some big things that you can do both for your students, perhaps for your staff, and also very much for yourself. The last point, take care of yourself both physically and mentally. Um, we've taken a hard hit, and I hope that music is one of the things that is a social emotional release for you as well. And with that, I'm going to uh, quit sharing my screen and come back to Rebecca. I hope I did that correctly. Perfect, thank you, Kathy. Would you mind going back to that false statement um, slide? And if, yeah, and if Shannon, okay. if you're comfortable in having a really quick discussion, I would love to do that super quick. Um, we don't have to record it if you don't want to. I might push pause. <laughs> Hi, sorry to make you uncomfortable. I'm gonna push pause recording. Um, but I really want to thank Kathy and thank you for joining us, everybody. And I think this was a very um, motivational and educational experience. So I hope that um, people out in IMEA YouTube world really um, take a chance to listen to this. And it's really beneficial. And remember, have a plan for social emotional learning. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. Take care. Have a wonderful school year. Thank you. Good night, all.